what's interesting is my mom often will remember me to me mm-hmm. now and yes. talk about me as if I'm a stranger. Oh, who yeah. She's because uh, my you know my mom was very much about her kids and and what they were doing and. You know, so she'll sometimes like, you know, just be like, well, I mean, I don't know if you know my son Gavin, but, you know, he lives in Toronto. And I'm like, oh, yeah. How does he like that? One time she said, he lives in Toronto with the get this, a guy. <laughs> get this. I know. And I was like, <laughs> well, OK. I thought we'd cross that hurdle I was like, many years ago. Yeah, I was like, OK, I know. I sort of know what period in time we are. And then I was just like, oh, I guess I'm a lady at one of the coffee clutches uh-huh. finding out about the gay son now. Let's yeah. see how this goes. Otherwise, did she say good things about you? I said, well, I'm sure he's happy. And she was like, oh, I'm, I think he is. He's He has a very nice um, boyfriend. Uh, <laughs> and then she said, but I mean, d- you know, don't tell his father. Or he'll take him out into a field and <laughs> that'll be that. <laughs> I'm Gavin Crawford. This is Let's Not Be Kidding. Episode 4, Children and Art. This episode is about what happens when you start to lose the things that are your core identifiers. You know, like when you don't recognize your own children anymore. How did you meet mom? I met her at university in Calgary. When I was on a double date with her and some, I, had, I wasn't dating her, I was dating a different girl. And she was with some other guy and I liked her better. So I uh, asked her out next. What made you pick mom? Have you seen your mother when she was 20? Yeah. She was awesome. She was smart. She was pretty. And I liked her. Sometimes you just like people. You see them, you like them. How long have you guys been married now? Since 1964. 58 years. A long time. Mom doesn't know she's been married for the last four or five years now. I just go by her facial expression. Sometimes she has a familiar look. Mom had all these looks. Well, she still has the looks. She still gives you the first slips and the... Yeah, the mad side eye. She still has that, you know. So I guess she's in there somewhere. How do you keep your sense of humor during all of this? I don't know. I guess that's where you get your sense of humor from. <laughs> It's the only way. You can't, you can't. I mean, I, I, I'm depressed Some I, I wouldn't lie. I'm depressed sometimes. And uh, so I listen to music or I just think about the good times. And, and of course, I have lots of distractions too. So yeah, I try and use distractions, do things. But it is hard sometimes. My mom used to sort of go in and out of knowing who I was. Occasionally she would mistake me for my dad, which was fine. Just for a minute, though. But it started to happen more and more for longer periods of time. I remember very distinctly we were driving around in Cape Breton, and we were just kind of chatting, and then she sort of started to ask me, like, you know, how's your sister? And I thought, she's fine, you just saw her. But I'm like, good, I'm trying to roll with it. And then she'd be like, what about your mom and dad? Do you ever see your mom and dad very much? And I just was laughing, and I'm like, well, you'd be surprised. But I realized as she was talking that she was asking me questions that would pertain to her childhood friend, Frank. My mother used to talk about Frank a fair amount when I was a kid. I never met him. She would always bring Frank up, particularly after my parents had had an argument or if my dad had done something that pissed her off. She would say things to me when I was a teenager like, you know, I should have just married Frank. Not like that would ever happen, but... Frank was always kind of a beacon of this sort of, like, better man that got away. But I noticed as she sort of started sinking further into memory loss, she would often confuse me with Frank. 
It started with her asking, you know, how's your sister? Do your parents still live by the candy store? Things like that. But then it would snap back very fast, and I'd suddenly be answering as if I was Frank and say, like, oh, you know, Jerry, well, she's, you know, got five kids, and she lives in uh, Lethbridge, and uh, I think one of your kids is friends with one of Jerry's kids, I would say to my mom, and then she would just be like, Gavin, what are you talking about? And then you'd be like, oh, we're back, and we're back. Uh, Joining us this week, it's my actual mom. Stay tuned for five minutes, and who knows who it will be, but uh, we're back now. But it never really bothered me because it was kind of short conversations. The only time it really, I guess, like, was a real oomph was my parents had come to stay at our house. It was February, and I came down on the morning of Valentine's Day, and we were sort of joking around, and I said, you know, happy Valentine's Day, Mom. And she was like, oh, is it Valentine's Day? And I was like, yeah, it's Valentine's Day. And then she just sort of looked at me and was like, well, I suppose you're going to the dance. Which threw me for a loop a little bit, and I was like, what? Dance. And then she said, probably every girl in the school wants to go with you. You've got your pick. And I realized at that moment, oh, I'm Frank. She's 14, and I'm Frank, and Frank has lots of friends that are girls. And so I didn't really know what to say, uh, you know, so I just kind of went along with it. And then I said, like, well, Donna, you know, I'm not going to the dance unless I'm going with you. And then she just looked at me and was like, well, I mean, we'll see. And I thought at the time that was so hilarious. I was like, oh, my God, I cannot wait to get to work and tell my coworkers what happened this morning. So I got to work. And, uh, you know, both of my two co-workers are there and we're talking about things. And I'm like, oh, this morning it was quite something. And I launched into the story, you know, it's Valentine's Day. And then she's like, oh, is it Valentine's Day? And I get to the part where I'm just like, well, I'm not going to the dance unless I'm going with you. And I just lose it. It, Like uh, the worst a most embarrassing, ugly cry in the middle of the story right before the punchline, which is, oh, so irritating to me. I was like, sorry, hang on. Back in a moment, I, like, went out, went to the bathroom like it was high school and, like, just sat in the cubicle and just, like, oh, I'm probably going to cry now just thinking about it. Like, because the hilarious fact that my mom didn't recognize me was hilarious until all of a sudden I just articulated it one too many times and it went into my soul and I just barf cried. Hello. Uh, Hi, I don't know if I have the right number. I'm looking for Frank Webb. Yes, you do. Uh, Hi, it's Gavin Crawford calling. I'm Donna Anderson's oldest son. Yes, Gavin. (laughs) Yes. Um, I'm working on a project about my mom and sort of the last thing. You start to look for reasons behind things that you can't explain. You know, I wanted to know why, why was I Frank? If you didn't mind, ideally I'd like to just zip out to Fort McLeod so I could talk to you in person. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd love to do that for you and I'll help you in any way. I don't know if I just needed to tell myself, oh, you know, Frank was particularly wonderful and that's why I'm Frank. Because she's mistaking me for somebody that's super great. And she would often mention that he had a lot of girls around him all the time. But not that he had a lot of girlfriends. And I I remember asking her when I was young, well, did you guys date? And she was like, no, no, we weren't like that. We were just friends. And so I kind of got it in my mind that maybe Frank was gay. Because when I was a kid, all of my friends were girls. And I had very close girlfriends that I didn't date. And I thought, oh, maybe that's it. She knows I'm gay, but she's mixing me up with her gay friend, best friend, Frank. I'm in Medicine Hat, Alberta. I've just driven up to um, the home of my mom's childhood friend, Frank Webb. And I'm going to go in and meet him. So I created this narrative of, like, unrequited love because he was gay and my mom wasn't. And my mom was into him, but he wasn't into her. And it just didn't work out. And they were Will and Grace and best friends. And that's a whole narrative that I created in my mind. 
Hello. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Good, how are you? Good, come on in. Nice to see you. So, so how are you? I'm pretty good. Yeah. All things considered. Oh, Don't great. take your shoes off. Oh, sure. No, no, just sit down. <laughs> Anywhere you like. As soon as I walked into Frank's house, I could see the weird connection between him and my mother in that... I think there was one of my mother's paintings on the wall, but there was a lot of Frank's paintings, and he works mostly in oils, but there was these beautiful, very harshly lit southern Alberta landscapes, like grain elevators with a very harsh shadow and a wheat field beside. That kind of beautiful desolation that is, in a way, southern Alberta. But he had a way of sort of capturing the beauty of that that I know my mother would love. So I, I got your, I didn't hear your first message. So oh. when you phoned me, that was, ooh, Captain Crawford, okay. <laughs> and uh, then the next day, it was... It turned out he's decidedly not gay, uh, but he did have an immaculate garden. Frank is actually, like, quite a handsome man. I mean, definitely an older man in his 70s now, but, you know, still not entirely gray and looks remarkably like my father. Here's, here's some pictures that I wanted you to see. See, I think this is grade five. This is seven. Is that you? That's me. Yep. You. Yeah. Looking at a picture of young you. That's me. That's me. Here's your mom. I can tell that's my mom. I'm like looking at a picture. I'm like, there's a picture of my mom in that's grade true. five or seven. Like, That'd be seven, probably. Frank's been with his wife, Norma, for almost 20 years. They're very happily married. But you can see a little bit of a what if. The same what if that was in my mom's voice when she would talk about Frank when I was a teenager. Just a casual wondering what would have happened if things had gone the other way. Why do you think that you loom so large and like, you know, you guys must have made a giant impact on each other. So we did. Because we did. Tom, your mother was... Uh was very popular uh, in school. I had some popularity too, but we just we just picked different people and. Uh... I was always curious because I'm always like, well, the way she that she talked, I'm like, but you guys didn't ever date? Not really. No. It was like, no, well, I don't know if he wanted to, or I don't know if I wanted to. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My mom and Frank did keep in touch over the years, and Frank told me that during one of their later conversations, he had to come clean about showing up 20 minutes late to my parents' wedding. I said, you know, I kind of I kinda missed your wedding. And she said, I knew you came in later. And I said, you know, if I'd have made it that way, there'd have been some goddamn stage, and they'd have said, does anyone object to this marriage? And I'd have been out there saying, I hate you. I thought you can't marry that woman. And we just laughed and laughed. And that's the last time we ever talked about that. This is partly why I wanted to come because they came down one Valentine's Day morning and I was like, Happy Valentine's Day, Mom. And she was like, Well, are you gonna are you going to the dance? And I thought, Oh, okay, I think I'm Frank now. Yeah. And then I didn't know what to do, so I just said, I down if I'm going to the dance at all, I'm going with you. Just to see what she would say. Yeah. And then, of course, she just, like, looked down and was like, well, yeah, I'll think about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's, that's interesting. No, that, that is interesting. We talked for about an hour and a half, and Frank was very happy to have seen me. I think he was very happy to sort of just jump back into that time. Driving back from Medicine Hat to Lethbridge is about a two-hour drive. And I sort of sat there wondering, did I feel better? Did I get what I wanted? And the honest answer is, I don't know. I mean, the only thing I really know is that sometimes she thinks I'm a guy who was pretty handsome. And I know she liked him a lot. And that's maybe enough. I mean, it has to be. Alzheimer's is a real take-what-you-can-get buffet.
Later on that trip, we brought my mom out of the home uh, to the house where my dad lives, where we all grew up, our house. And uh, I mentioned to her that I had been to see Frank, just to see what she would say. I saw your friend Frank. He lives in Medicine Hat. He said he didn't come to your wedding. He had to sit in the car. What is his name? Frank? Or... What did uh, Frank have to say about Donna? He told me some good stories, he said. He said he had a funny memory, then he told me he was a lifeguard, and then one time Donna, you, came out in this two-piece bathing suit. And he said she really wore it well. <laughs> Then his other memory was the time he wore a black sweater, shiny black sweater. And I said, that's your, your memories are the times my mom just looked hot. Did <laughs> he remember all the times mom looked really hot? He really liked you. He said he had a lot of fun in the poor McLeod. I could tell from your face you pretty much liked him too. I mean, it's tough, right? Because on one hand, it's like you grow up with a person and you know them better than most people on this earth. And you like to think that they also know you better than most people on this earth. And then there's all of a sudden this moment where, like, you look into somebody's eyes and they don't recognize you. This is my friend J.P. LaRock, a screenwriter. You might know them from One Girl, Five Gays from back in the day. They've been navigating their grandmother's dementia. It's hard not to be hurt by that and hard not to be, like, devastated. But also immediately, I think, recognizing in that moment that this is something that's, like, bigger than them. It's people, I think, that she clearly had specific types of emotional relationships with that I think were the same kinds of connections. I mean, I think it's like, I I think it's kind of beautiful because it's like, it's this thing of like, in our lives, there are specific things that we look for, like specific aspects of people that we try to find that engage with us in a specific way. And so it's like, in our lifetime, it's natural that over the course of however many years, we're going to find multiple people who are going to scratch that itch. I think what's wild is the idea that, like, you get to this place where all of a sudden you flatten all of those people into one, right? And and about, like, and I always think to myself that scary thing of, like, you know, it's like, if you were ever a person navigating this illness, like, all the truth is that would come to the surface about how you feel about specific people, right? Because it's like... There's no denying what that emotional connection is when you're looking at a loved one and they remind you of another person who you didn't realize was a loved one, but is also a loved one. It's possible that my mom associates me with Frank because I'm artistic. I mean, I I don't paint, but I'm an artist in a way. And Frank is an artist. And when they were kids, they would talk about art. And I really think that, you know, besides being a mother and a teacher and a designer and a number of other things, at the core of my mother's being, she was first and foremost an artist. You remember the painting she had, the one that hang, hanged in our front room on the wall with the lights in it? And the big, It was a big tree. That's still there, isn't it? No, I took it down. This is my dad again. That was a pretty awesome painting, that. That was, like, a really original. Yeah, like the huge fabric art tree that was lit up from the back. Yeah, yeah, no, it was awesome, yeah. Like almost all of Mom's art, it looked amazing and a little scary. Yeah. I, I, you know, the one where she has the... One where she's supposed to have a migraine where she has that picture with... That's scary, that one. I didn't like that one. She made this self-portrait in university. It was one of the assignments, and she had chosen to do a lino cut. 
I asked my sister how she would describe it. Well, she said that was her with a migraine. Right. right. And like, well, it looks like all the ligaments, like you could see like every muscle and ligament in her face kind of, and then the eyes are like really wide and like looking out. It's funny because it's like a bit horrifying, but it is the thing that looks the most like mom to me. Yeah, it totally does. It actually really does look like her. And that's like, that's what I mean. Like she was like a little bit weird. I can kind of mark the phases of my mom's life just by the art that was being produced. The encaustic wax years. Stained glass. I mean, there was one particular piece of art my mom made that haunted all of us when we were growing up. We used to do gymnastics in my parents' bedroom because it was the biggest room in the house and it had the most amount of floor space. And I remember my sister doing a handstand and looking at this particular piece of art and being like, what is that? And I said, mom says it's a metaphor. And she's like, what's that? And I'm like, oh, it just means it's a sculpture. And then she's like, well, I think it's scary. In the early 80s, my mom went back to university to finish her Bachelor of Fine Arts uh, in her 40s. She majored in painting, but as part of a course, she was required to do a sculpture. And that is how we ended up with what we all called the Black Shelf. It was an enormous half octagon made of wood, about eight feet long and about five feet high. Spokes ran up from the center, and there were shelves and nooks all over it. So it basically just looked like a huge wooden spider web, painted glossy jet black, and the shelves were full of objects from our childhood, some of which we were shocked to see that we were no longer able to play with because they were now permanently glued to the black shelf and painted in glossy enamel black. There was Barbie parts. There was a ceramic doll head, one of my train engines, a bunch of our old shoes from when we were a kid. The entire thing painted glossy, glossy black so that when you first looked, you couldn't really see anything. Just a big black mass. But as you got closer, you could see each individual object. My father absolutely hated it. And my grandmother, his mother, once called it a cry for help. But my mother, partly because everyone hated it, kept it with her secret smile, always saying she was planning to move it somewhere else, but never getting around to it. So for 10 years, it just stood there in their bedroom, this monolith of terror. I remember we'd often stop doing gymnastics for a moment, my sister and I, just to stand and stare at that black shelf, trying to wonder what it was supposed to mean. Did it mean that she never wanted to have kids? My older sister floated once, which made my younger sister cry. And then we had to calm her down and promise that was a joke. To me, it looked like those ducks that you see on TV after an oil spill. Ruined, but also shiny. Eventually, the black shelf just became too hard to dust, and the gloss wore off, and the whole thing began to look kind of gray and spiderwebby. And then one day, it was gone. I asked my mom once why she got rid of the black shelf. She just smiled her little cryptic smile and said it had served its purpose. But I think of that black shelf now as a different kind of metaphor. I think of it as a metaphor for her brain. Because it's all these detailed memories but painted black and fading into each other so you can't really tell one from the other. She doesn't talk about Fort McLeod anymore or Frank or remember how she used to think you were Frank and then she thought I was Frank and She thought her grandmother lived here. She doesn't do that anymore. She just, she, I don't know what she does. Uh, it's hard. Yeah, it's also really sad. Yeah. Heartbreaking. I 
Identity is a very strange thing. Everyone's identity is wrapped up in a whole bunch of things. I know so much of my identity is wrapped up in my work and what I do for a living, but also there's so much of my own identity that's wrapped up in my mom reflecting back to me. So when she's no longer there in an active way to reflect it back, you do start to wonder, who am I then? We'd make sure she had a sketchbook or something if we were going on vacation, and she just wouldn't use it. Like, I think she just she just lost the ability to paint, which was just... Just to see the difference in the artwork she was making. One sketch, you open it up, and I thought it was one of the kids drawing. Like, it was not her. It was not her normal work. I don't want you to get the wrong impression that I'm trying to pretend like Alzheimer's isn't sad. Because it's incredibly sad. But you have to find something in it that isn't. Or it's too much. You know, you can only cry so, so much. much. Yeah. But you literally do <laughs> empty out. Yeah. I was like, uh, yeah, so here I'm talking to my friend Aurora Brown from Baroness Von Sketch Show, who's experiencing Alzheimer's with her father right now. Yeah. Um, you know, but I mean, I sort of waffle back and forth, you know, sort of the weirdest things. Well, you know, I'll watch, you know, uh, the Angry Birds movie. <laughs> yeah. You know, and all of a sudden I'll be like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. I'm like, Kyle will come in and be like, what's wrong? And I'm like, it's just the angry birds. <laughs> Never, they're friends. <laughs> you just made, the pigs made friends. Shut up. Just go away. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. I can't watch Lord of the Rings right now oh. unless I watch Lord of the Rings sometimes literally as a cry therapy. Uh -huh. Because, like, I've watched it so many times that I know so many things. Like, when which, part, which parts get I can make my part. I can make myself cry right now just this second by just thinking of... Pippin on the tower and then yeah. Mary riding away with Gandalf. Yep, yeah. And then I'm just like, but sometimes let's go to that scene. I'm like, you know what? I got emotions about something, and you know who's going to take it out of me? The fool of a Took. Yeah. <laughs> Mary and Pippin, on, and oh, that's yeah. it. I, 100% also, people, you know, people poo poo fantasy, but like I, I have rewatched the bit in Fellowship of the Ring where Gandalf was talking to Frodo in the Mines of Moria. So many times, you know, Ian McKellen explaining to him that, you know, all who live to see such times feel this way. And all that you can do is decide what to do with the time that is given to you. And then also in Return of the King, where he's talking to Mary about like, you know, like his death the end. He's like, oh, no. It and doesn't end here. It doesn't end here. And it, it, it keeps on going. White shores as far as the eye can see. Yeah. It's it's, uh, it's a crazy. Wow, this went nerdy. Yeah, it did. <laughs> but you have to do that. Whatever it is, like maybe you know, maybe there are people out there. They don't have, you know, they they don't get into sci-fi or thing. But they have whatever it is, and you know, this is where myth comes in. You know, like my dad is not chained to a rock, and there's not an actual eagle coming and ripping out his liver every day. He's not actually pushing up a stone up the hill that rolls down every day, but it feels like it. And, and it's very possible in a couple of weeks he might tell you that's happening. Exactly. <laughs> when you watch someone losing their memories, it makes you kind of wonder what is left. If we don't have stories or memories, what do we have? I mean, there isn't a lot of things that we can leave behind that sort of mark our time here. But in the words of Stephen Sondheim from... Sunday in the Park with George, there are two things that you can leave behind that matter or last, and that's children and art. There's a point in the musical where an older character sings, just as you said from the start, children and art. Children and art. And I think about that a lot because it comforts me to know that you know, whenever the time comes, whether my mom knows or not, uh, she'll definitely have left behind a lot of both.
Coming up next time on Let's Not Be Kidding. So one of the things we would do together in the fall of 2020 is like go and stop at the um, uh, the Subaru place and just kind of look at cars and he liked to have that chat with people. Were you always on pins and needles like when they say let's go for a test drive? Well I wasn't until this one day because he's like I'm going to go in and talk to the guy so I said okay well I'll stay with the car and then he'd been gone for a while and I got out of the car and walked and just happened to intercept my dad pulling out (laughs) like pulling up to the exit in a new Subaru going for a test drive by himself. And I was like, what? And I was so mad at him. You know, I got in with him and helped him and stuff like that. But I was like, I can't believe you're doing, you know, it was one of the few times I allowed my anger to kind of unload on him. And he was so crestfallen. I felt awful. It's all fun and games until someone loses their license. Hide the keys. Next time on Let's Not Be Kidding. You've been listening to Let's Not Be Kidding from CBC Podcasts. The show is written and hosted by me, Gavin Crawford. David Carroll is my producer, story editor, and sound designer. Emily Cannell is our digital coordinating producer. Original music by William Lamoureux. Our senior producer is Damon Fairless. Executive producers are Cecil Fernandez and Chris Oak. Tanya Springer is the senior manager of CBC Podcasts, and Arif Narani is the director.